Jo Dempster, STEM tutor at Dumfries House. We're really missing you on the estate at the moment, particularly as it's been such a glorious spring, although I seem to have struck on the only overcast day to do my filming. With it being so nice, as an ecologist, I'm wondering whether all this really lovely weather is having an effect on the animals and plants around us. So we're going to do some science to try and find out. Ecologists are scientists who are interested in the interaction between plants and animals and their environment. Professional ecologists will spend their time monitoring different species to find out how they impact on each other. They might monitor using just their senses to see, hear and even smell what is happening around them, or they might use technology to get more detailed observations like binoculars, microscopes or magnifying glasses. They might also use scales, measuring tapes or timers to make different kinds of observations. In this video, I'll be talking about how the seasonal changes that we see around us impact the plants and animals we are living alongside. The seasons are a predictable cycle of weather patterns that is common in our part of the world. They are influenced by the change in angle of the planet towards or away from the sun, meaning the sun shines brighter on us in the UK during the summer and less on us during the winter. The heat from the sun doesn't just affect temperature, but all kinds of other weather patterns that change the kind of weather we get each season. The seasons in the UK normally move in a pretty predictable cycle. However, with climate change, there is some evidence that the seasons may be shifting slightly. In fact, research has shown that events in spring might be happening earlier than usual. To find out if the seasons are shifting, we need to make observations. Citizen scientists working with the Woodland Trust have selected a series of events that happen during spring or autumn and have been recording the time of year that these events have happened every year since 1753. That's over 250 years of recording the date of some key springtime events. Phenology is the study of seasonal events and how these change over time. Some events in spring might be triggered by increasing temperatures, whilst others might be triggered by increasing day length. If these get mismatched, this can cause problems in food chains, how animals rely on each other for food and survival. All living things are part of a food chain. This means they rely on one another for food. An example of a simple food chain might be a tree gets its energy from the sun, the caterpillar gets its energy from eating the leaves on the tree, and the blue tit gets its energy from eating the caterpillar. If one part of the chain is disrupted, then it has an effect on everything else. Many animals and plants time key events like growing their first leaves, laying their eggs, or migrating on cues like temperature or daylight length. And if the timing of these seasons changes, then that could disrupt the whole food chain. So we know why it's important, but now I'm going to talk to you about a few things you can look out for and record to help make sense of the seasons for science. The project we're going to use to help us monitor the changing seasons is called Nature's Calendar. It's a project run by the Woodland Trust and they've got a really great website worth checking out if you want to have a go. We are going to focus on changes in trees. So in spring, Nature's Calendar would be looking for blossom on trees or the first leaf. And in autumn, they're going to be looking at things like the changing colour of the leaves or the leaves falling off the trees. For us, this means we're going to have to learn how to identify a few species of common British tree. So that's what we'll start with. Here are my hints for learning to identify some common British tree species. Before you start worrying about getting your identification guide out, learn some new vocabulary. For example, this kind of leaf here is what's known as a compound leaf. This is the whole leaf, but off of one central vein you'll get these smaller leaflets that make up the whole. You can even see here at the end where the leaf attaches to the tree. In contrast, this is a simple leaf. Again, you can see the end where the leaf attaches to the tree, but instead of being made up of smaller parts, this is one whole leaf. So, compound, made up of smaller leaflets, simple, one whole leaf. Veins are these channels that run through the leaf and carry nutrients to the edge of the leaf and back into the tree. There are two different ways these veins can be arranged, pinnate and palmate. A pinnate leaf has veins that are arranged off of one central pin. You can see the main vein runs through the leaf from top to bottom and most of the other major veins come straight off of that one vein. This is a pinnate leaf. Palmate leaves, instead of having one central pin, all of their main veins come off of 
one point at the base of the leaf like this. A little bit like spreading your palm out and having your fingers all come off from one central point. So pinnate veins come off a central pin, palmate veins come out from the centre of the leaf. Another feature to look out for is whether or not the leaf has teeth. These serrations along the edge of the leaf are what are known as teeth. You can see that in this leaf we've got quite a jagged edge and in this leaf we've got a very smooth edge. So this one has teeth and this one doesn't. The final vocabulary I'll introduce you to just now is whether or not a leaf has lobes. Lobes, a little bit like your ear lobes, are these protrusions that sit out of the side of your leaf. So this leaf here is a perfect example. You can see the lobes are these lumps on the edge of the leaf surface. You can have lobes that are smooth, like this leaf, or you can have lobes that are pointed, like this leaf. Have a go at a bit of a leaf treasure hunt, using the features you've just learned. You might be looking for a palmate leaf with a toothed edge that is simple, or you might be looking for a compound leaf, like this one. Use the vocabulary until you are used to it. Finally, get yourself an ID guide. The Woodland Trust has plenty available online, or if you have a smartphone, you could try the Woodland Trust Tree ID app. You'll find this much easier to use now that you know some of the vocabulary it refers to, and you've started to notice the difference between tree leaves. I've also left some useful links in the video description to get you started. Once you've learned to identify a few tree species, you'll be ready to record for Nature's Calendar. While we've missed most of the spring events so far, towards the end of summer you'll start to spot some signs of autumn like the leaf tint. What I would recommend is picking a tree nearby where you live that you can visit regularly and keeping an eye out for the first signs of autumn. This could be berries or changing colour of leaves. That means you can visit the tree regularly and spot the first date which these changes occur. Visit the Nature's Calendar website and have a look at their date range poster to see what kind of events the project is recording. I know I have some beautiful elder trees nearby, so I'll check them on a regular basis for their first fruit and note down when I see them. As a fun side note, elder flowers and berries can be used to make drinks, syrups, jams and tarts, so they're a good one to learn early on. Although, as with anything in nature, only eat what you are 100% sure you can identify. There are other trees and shrubs with similar flowers, berries and leaves. If you are shielding or unable to take part in monitoring for another reason, you can still have a closer look at the data using Nature's Calendar's maps. And if you're a student working on a school, college or university project, you can request the raw Nature's Calendar data to use in your own research. Because of citizen scientists recording for Nature's Calendar, we now know some amazing things about our seasons. We know that in the UK, spring is arriving on average 11 days earlier than it did in the 19th century. We also know that birds that migrate are particularly badly affected by this because they end up out of sync with their food sources, while some other species are able to adapt to these changes. We also know that in cities and towns with lots of artificial lighting, trees are growing their leaves around 7.5 days earlier than average. All of this information because of citizen scientists. Based on previous years, we'd expect to see our first autumn colours in August. You should keep an eye out for them and record them on nature's calendar when you do spot them. However, do you know what causes the leaf colour to change? We'll finish off our video with a quick explanation of what's going on under the surface of the leaf. For the craft activity, you'll need a sheet of paper and pens or pencils in a dark colour as well as red, yellow, orange and green. You might also want some blue tack. It'll be useful but not essential. So to start off with, why are leaves green? The light from the sun is made up of all the colours that we see, along with some that we can't. But when combined together, they appear white. However, when that mix of lights hits an object, some of the colours are absorbed so that we don't see them and others are reflected. We only see the colours that are reflected. Leaves contain pigments that absorb and reflect different mixes of this colour of light. Most leaves contain high quantities of a pigment called chlorophyll. Chlorophyll reflects green light, so when the sunlight hits a leaf, the green light reflects back into our eye, making the leaf appear green. 
Hidden behind the chlorophyll are other pigments that reflect different colours, carotenes that reflect orange and xanthophyll that reflects yellow. These pigments are in the leaf the whole year, but hidden behind the chlorophyll, so you won't see the yellows or oranges while the chlorophyll is there. Some trees can produce a fourth type of pigment called anthocyanin. Anthocyanin reflects red light and is only produced by a few trees like maple. Rather than being there all along, the anthocyanin is only produced in autumn when the leaves start to be cut off from the rest of the tree. This causes a buildup of sugar in the leaf, which allows the anthocyanin to be produced. We can demonstrate how these colours change in autumn with a quick craft activity. First, I'll fold my paper into three sections like this. Don't worry, they don't have to be perfect, just try to get them roughly the same size. Then I'll give my middle section a title, All Year. On this section, I'll draw an outline of a leaf. I've chosen a maple leaf and you can see that it's got a smooth edge, with large lobes and a palmate vein arrangement. I'm then going to fold over the right half of my paper and trace the leaf shape onto that and give it the title Autumn. And finally, fold the left side in, trace it again and give it the title Spring Summer. If it's tricky to see your lines to trace, sticky tack your paper to a window. The light will shine through the paper and make it easier to see your lines. Now you need to add your pigments. We know that the yellow and orange pigments, carotene and xanthophyll, are around all year. So these are the colours we will use for our all year leaf. Write the pigment colours below the leaf to help you remember them. In autumn, maple trees can produce the red pigment anthocyanin, so we will colour our autumn leaf in red, again writing the pigment name below. And finally, in spring and summer, the leaf is full of the green pigment chlorophyll, so we will colour that one in green. Trees require lots of sunlight to be able to produce chlorophyll, so it isn't around during the darker months. You are now ready to demonstrate how these colour changes occur. I've stuck my paper to a window to let the light shine through one layer of paper to another. All year round, the carotenes and xanthophyll are present in the leaf. These pigments reflect yellow and orange light. However, during the spring and summer, the leaf gets plenty of light and produces chlorophyll, covering the xanthophyll and carotene up and making the leaf appear green. The yellow and orange pigments are still there, just hidden, meaning only the green light is reflected. When autumn comes, however, the tree does not get enough sunlight to keep producing chlorophyll, and it breaks down leaving the yellow and orange exposed. And some trees, like maple, will produce a red pigment called anthocyanin, adding some red to the colour of the leaf. Eventually, however, all these pigments break down, the leaf dries up, and it falls to the ground. I hope you've enjoyed today's video and have learned a little bit about seasonal science. Although we can't welcome you onto the estate just for now, I hope these videos are helping you out with your home learning. I hope to see you soon. That's all from me. Take care.